Take a look at this baseball team. They're the 2022 World Series winners, the Houston Astros. Kyle Tucker, this time they finished the job! More than half the players on this team aren't from the United States. 13 of them in this photo are from Latin America. But one country in particular stands out with six players on this team, the Dominican Republic. In fact, some of the best Dominican players are in huge major league teams across the country. Overall, they make up more than 10% of all players in the league, by far the most in the pool of foreign-born players. So what's so special about baseball in the DR, and why do so many of its players end up in the U.S.? Yes, there's no doubt about it, baseball is king. Baseball has a very long history in the U.S. A college student scribbled something about playing baseball way back in 1786, and that's considered the first mention of the game in the country. Over time, college campuses became home to baseball, while professional teams started shaping up across many states. By 1901, a couple of wealthy Americans organized these teams into two professional leagues, the National League and the American League. Together, they would eventually become known as Major League Baseball, or the MLB. Since the 1900s, teams have been playing against each other until the best from each league ends up in the World Series. The first World Series was a hit right away. It brought in over 100,000 attendees and tens of thousands of dollars. Over the next few years, millions of fans bought tickets to these games and baseball executives started building massive stadiums to make room for them. By the early 20th century, baseball became a very profitable industry, and it became known as America's favorite pastime. But during all that time, baseball was becoming the favorite pastime over here in the DR too. And it got there via Cuba. The game first arrived here in Havana in the 1860s, mostly through elite Cuban students who attended college in the U.S. and brought the game back home with them. Some of them set up teams that started playing each other. Eventually, the sport spread through affluent Cubans in Havana to the working class around the country. If it's a company and the owner of the company is the one playing the game, they might encourage their workers to play the game as well so that their game can be played. For the game to become a national entity, it has to be rooted in the working class. Over the years, baseball became such a big part of the country's identity that Cubans took their favorite sport with them wherever they went. That happened in the 1860s, when many slaves revolted against the wealthy, especially sugar plantation owners who fled in search of a new place to set up shop. They ended up nearby, in the Dominican Republic, and they brought baseball with them. Once again, the sport first took off with an affluent crowd in the capital before taking hold with workers in the East, especially the city of San Pedro de Macorís, where Cuban expats had set up their sugar refineries. What these refinery managers and owners did was they created incentives for their workers, namely that if you can beat a nearby refinery next Saturday, well, you just don't have to work. Games between refineries here became huge spectacles and a pastime for Dominicans everywhere. When you have the economic incentive wedded to a tremendous fan base and passion so that after the game, people argue about it, who played what, uh, who was excellent, who wasn't. They're creating a baseball culture. Back in the U.S. and Cuba, baseball continued to thrive. Teams in the U.S. played more and more games throughout the country, making baseball a million-dollar industry. While in Cuba, it became the most popular sport for a very different reason. For many, many years, when Spanish colonial rulers tried to squash Cuban identity, including their love of baseball, Cubans pushed back. Instead of giving up the sport, they turned it into a symbol of pride and nationalism. After the Spanish-American War, Spain left Cuba and the U.S. occupied the country for four years. That's when Americans learned more about Cuban baseball talent. 
and the MLB soon realized they could get skilled players on cheaper contracts than some American players. So they started signing Cuban players. By the late 1950s, the MLB had signed 49 Cubans, and players like Minnie Monoso and Huiz Aloma had become household names. But after decades of U.S. military interventions in Cuba, the two countries broke relations in 1961 after the Cuban Revolution and Fidel Castro's rise to power. This was the scene of turmoil in the capital, Havana, as the climax of revolution was reached. That put the MLB's entire operation at risk because they couldn't rely on Cuban talent anymore. There had to be something monumental that broke that trend. Once that trade embargo happened, then that talent had to be picked up from elsewhere. And that was an opening for the Dominican Republic. No question that that played a big, a big role. The U.S. and the DR had a very rough relationship at first. In the early 20th century, the DR owed a significant amount of money to Europe. And that created the possibility of a European military intervention. But the U.S. didn't want European forces near its borders, so it sent troops to occupy the DR. The occupation was brutal and lasted eight years. But something unexpected happened during the occupation. Dominicans played baseball games against the U.S. troops and often beat them. Many of the local players, especially around the San Pedro Sugar Mills area, where a lot of the fighting took place, were against the occupation. So these games took on a new meaning. What is interesting is that that the game it's not so much beating the Americans, but that as a result of beating the Americans, they get more pride in their own game. By the 1930s, after the occupation ended, professional teams in the DR were getting bigger. And it became an arena where players from the Sugar Mill teams could showcase their talent on a national stage. But even the best Dominican players, many of whom were of Black African descent, didn't end up with the MLB at that time, because in the U.S., the baseball leagues were segregated. So instead of trying to make it in the U.S., the professional league in the DR brought over talented American baseball players from the Negro League who were also left out of the MLB. Players from this league ended up playing in the DR during their off-seasons for extra income. Like Satchel Paige, who was paid thousands of dollars for playing on Dominican dictator Rafael Trujillo's professional team. These Dominican professional league games drew thousands of spectators who wanted to watch Negro League players, as well as the Dominican players who were now receiving more attention. So by the late 1950s, after the desegregation of baseball in the U.S., the MLB turned its full attention to the DR. They found a new pipeline for talent. It was an extension of the neo-colonial relation. Major League Baseball was finding cheap resources, signing it on the cheap, taking it to elsewhere to get refined and consumed in another place. By the 1960s, the MLB was expanding quickly. They added more teams that meant they needed more players. They signed outstanding Dominican players like Ozzy Virgil, the Alou brothers, and Juan Marichal, who brought thousands of fans to the MLB games. Soon, the MLB wanted more Dominican players, but they quickly realized they needed local scouts to spot talent. That's where popular scouts like Epi Guerrero and Ralph Avila came in. Epi created the country's first baseball academy in the 1970s to train young talent. Then in 1987, Ralph created an academy that was directly linked to an MLB team in the US, the Los Angeles Dodgers. The LA team invested millions in this academy. Together, they created a formal process for Dominican players to end up on MLB teams. It goes something like this. Dominican scouts identify new talent throughout the country. Then they hold tryouts where players showcase their skills. The most impressive players get a contract to train with the academy. If a player makes it through training, they either sign a professional contract to continue training with a minor league team in the US or make it to an MLB team. Only a small percentage of the trainees actually achieve the MLB dream. But that's what happened with former pitcher Ramon Martinez, who went straight from the academy to playing for the LA Dodgers. And Ramon Martinez, no hitting the Marlins, seven to nothing. Soon, other big teams set up academies that helped them spot and train major players like Robinson Cano and Sammy Sosa, who eventually became all-stars. 
This pipeline of talent works so well for the MLB that there are now 30 academies in the DR, one for each of the 30 MLB teams in the U.S. Since the beginning of the academy system, the MLB has signed hundreds of Dominican players. And the leading cities for this talent pipeline are the same as the ones where the Sugar Mill games were once played, with San Pedro right at the top. The system has created an opportunity for top Dominican players to end up with the MLB. And they make millions now. But no matter how far some Dominican players go, the MLB still signs many others for less than some American players. So this is still a way for them to make massive profits in the U.S. while giving foreign-born players cheaper contracts. The DR makes money off the academy system too. The scouts help negotiate better contracts for the players, but keep a massive cut for themselves at every turn. Overall, Dominican players bring in about $400 million per year in the major league, and they send about half of that home. Plus, the academies bring in about $125 million a year, create more jobs, and the MLB spends millions maintaining them. There's no question that after agriculture and tourism, baseball has become the third leading source of revenue for the country as a whole. Before the Dominican players who help generate so much of the profit, the system has a long way to go. Some Dominican all-stars are starting to push for that change. They're using their fame in the MLB to ask for a system that works equally for players in both countries. To them, baseball is as much Dominican as it is American. They are so passionate about the game. They have such a deep history for the game, an understanding of the game. They're actually in positions of control. So it's a battle between who controls the game. Hey everyone, I'm Raja, the producer of this episode of Vox Atlas. Thank you so much for watching. There's so much we couldn't get to, but this video is just a start. If you want to learn more about what players go through in these academies, we added a couple of great resources in our description as well. Our goal with Atlas and all of our coverage is to help you understand big global topics, which is why we want to keep our work for free. But advertising isn't enough to support all the work that goes into Atlas. If you really like our videos, head to vox.com slash give now to chip in and keep our work free for everyone. Once you're a contributor, you'll get behind the scenes emails and alerts on how to get involved. Thank you for watching.